The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Kirchen with the APS TARC, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar live with ACL, final, APS Final Rule. Today we have four speakers that are going to review the APS Final Rule with you today. We have Alice Kelsey here today, the Deputy Director for the Administration on Aging. Aaron Key, the Aging Program Specialist with uh, the Office of Elder Justice and APS. Um, myself, Jennifer Kirchen with the APS TARC, and then my fellow coworker, Mike Bischoff with the APS TARC. Today, we're gonna have Alice kick us off and do some opening remarks. So next slide, please. Great, thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you today, and I want to acknowledge the significance of a first adult protective services rule and the benefits it will bring to the APS programs across the nation. Your valuable input into the rule shaped the final rule and will benefit the program for years to come. So thank you for all that you have done so far and thank you for all you will be doing to implement this final rule. I also want to recognize and give a big thank you to our amazing team joining you today and all the hard work they put into getting this significant rule across the finish line and for all they are doing and will continue to do to support this amazing network to implement the final rule. As is being demonstrated through this webinar today, ACL is here to support APS state programs and committed to your partnership. ACL plans to provide the support, training, and technical assistance to the state APS programs as you begin your work towards coming into compliance with the final APS rule. We plan to provide support in three main ways. The first is communicating the requirements of the rules to states to make sure that you clearly understand the overall requirements of the regulation areas. The second is understanding the needs of states for technical assistance. And the third is providing training and technical assistance. Today's webinar is the first webinar in a series where ACL will be walking through the regulations section by section. ACL's goal is to support states throughout the compliance period as you all work to be, bring your state programs into compliance with this new rule. We know states are anxious to begin working on coming into compliance, and today we plan to provide states with the tools to facilitate that process. So now I'll pass this webinar over to Erin Key. Erin is the Aging Program Specialist in the Administration on Aging's Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services. Thank you, Alice. Next slide, please. I wanted to start the webinar today with a recap of this year's activities related to the APS final rule. On May 7th, 2024, ACL published the final rule to establish the first ever fed federal regulations for adult protective services. With the publication of the final rule, ACL is now able to more fully support the national network that delivers APS with the ultimate goal of better meeting the needs of adults who experience or are at risk of maltreatment or self-neglect. The regulations took effect on June 7, 2024, but regulated entities have until May 8, 2028 to fully comply. ACL's goal is to support states throughout the compliance period as you all work to bring your state programs into compliance with the new rule. You can learn more about the rule at acl.gov backslash APS rule. To understand how ACL can support the states, this summer we held an APS state directors meeting where we discussed with state directors what they needed to know about the final rule. During that meeting, we also gathered information from the state directors about what type of technical assistance is needed and the best way for ACL to provide that information. Today, I'm going to be go going over some of our training and technical assistance plans for the next year based on that feedback, but I wanna start with a brief overview of the final rule. Next slide, please. ACL had two goals with the final rule. The first goal was to elevate best practices from APS systems across the country and bring greater consistency to APS systems nationwide while respecting the unique needs of states and localities. 
The second goal was to minimize the burden on state APS systems while also setting minimum standards to ensure quality APS services. Next slide. Within the rule, there are also some overarching themes. The rule emphasizes person directedness and least restrictive alternatives as core values in APS practice and also provides states with flexibility in implementing the rule. Next slide. The principles of self-determination are foundational to the final rule. The rule requires APS systems to receive and respond to reports in a manner that incorporates per principles of person-directed services and planning. The final rule requires that planning and delivery of all services are made in consultation with the client and that the provision or referral to services respects the autonomy of clients and their values about safety and quality of life. Finally, the rule requires informing clients of their rights related to APS under state law during their first meeting, including the right to refuse to speak to APS, to accept or decline services, and their right to confidentiality. Next slide. The rule places an emphasis on and strong preference for least restrictive alternatives. There are specific provisions related to APS serving as guardians or petitioning for guardianship unless it is unavoidable. An emergency protective action should only be taken as a measure of last resort to protect the life and safety of the client. And the rule emphasizes that adults are presumed to have the capability to make decisions about how to live and care for themselves unless a court of law has determined otherwise. Next slide. Finally, the rule promotes state flexibility. The rule standards represent a minimum floor and states are encouraged to adopt services, practices, and processes that exceed them. There is no requirement, for example, to adopt the definitions in the rule verbatim. The rule also allows for flexible protocols for APS and accepting reports 24-7 and flexibility within the requirement for APS 24-hour immediate need response. Next slide. This fall, we will begin by communicating the requirements of the rule. This will take the form of a webinar series. Every other month, we will host a webinar, and each webinar will cover a specific section of the regulation. During the alternating months, we will have listening and networking sessions to discuss the previous month's webinar. This format begins today, as you can see on the schedule, with this webinar, which is covering planning for compliance. Next month in December, we will have our first listening session. I'm sorry, next month in November, we will have our first listening session which will be related to this webinar. During the listening session, you will be able to discuss what we've talked about today, planning for compliance, and also ask questions. In December, we are planning to walk through the definition section of the rule. You can go ahead and mark these dates on your calendar because we are gonna have a reoccurring schedule on the second Thursday of each month from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. However, we will be sending out registration information closer to the date of each webinar. Next slide, please. In addition to providing these webinars and listening sessions, we will also be developing fact sheets, FAQs, and other resources as needed to assist with implementation of the rule. We will also continue to provide support to states through our project officers, the POs will maintain their ongoing check-in calls with states and they will be available to answer questions. As questions arise that are specific to the new APS rule, states should reach out directly to their PO. ACL is tracking your questions as we receive them and we will be answering them throughout the year as we conduct these webinars and provide resources. We will use the information to identify trends and questions, to understand which parts of the rules are most confusing to states, and plan the schedule of webinar topics and resources accordingly. And that's why on the schedule from the previous page, we have the topics for this webinar and December, but we, the rest of the topics for the remainder of the year are TBD as we learn more from you all about what you need most um, assistance with. Next slide. 
All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So as I said in the introduction, Mike Bischoff and I are going to kind of handle this next section about implementing the rule requirements and some um, suite of tools that we're going to offer as far as worksheets and things that we can support you on. So next slide, please. A little bit about the APS TARC. Um, the mission of the APS TARC is to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs, and we support APS programs kind of in three different ways. Uh, the use of data and analytics through our NAMERS database, um, applying research and evaluation through our research projects, and then encouraging the innovation of best practice and strategies and providing technical assistance, which we also provide through um, you know, one-off questions or ad hoc questions and state meetings that usually happen monthly or um, on a reoccurring basis with your TARC liaison. Next slide. A little bit of housekeeping. So we've got quite a few handouts on the handout section of this webinar. All the handouts will be available on our website and in Huddle after the presentation today. So you should be able to find those. Uh, you can feel free to download those um, out of the handout section in your webinar. If you do need to go back and find them, you will be able to find them on the TARC website and in Huddle. Um, we've got um, computer speakers and audio. Please make sure that if you have any audio um, issues, you um, leave the webinar, come back, and that seems to fix any audio issues that you might have. Um, and next slide, please. So kind of going back to reaffirm some of the things that Erin had talked about. So the final rule was to establish federal regulations for APS programs. And these new standards really codify the existence of the National Voluntary Consensus Guidelines, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. So building upon that, um, the final rule sets the kind of floor for states to um, adopt practices. And, and like Aaron had said, there is some flexibility in the way that you implement the final rule. Um, and the floor of the final rule implementation is the kind of the minimum standard. So you can go above and beyond what the final rule says, but really keeping in mind that floor that the standards really represent. Um, and like Erin also said, ACL will work with APS programs to implement the final rule um, and provide technical assistance to develop state plans in the future. Um, we're not at the point where um, state plans are even under consideration, but um, as we have talked about in the past, the operational plans are kind of a gateway into your state plan. Um, having spend plans go along with your operational plan kind of gets you into the groove of creating that state plan. So start planning now. The um, state plans aren't required till 2028, but um, you should have kind of a, a base or a format that you plan to use uh, when you are developing that state plan. So next slide, please. Highlights of the federal rule. So we know as we have been perusing the federal rule that it, it establishes federal definitions uh, for the two terms that are foundational to APS. Um, it also in includes data collection and standardization between um, states so that one state is collecting kind of the same information, but it doesn't require the states to have kind of that verbatim um, definition or practice. It allows for that state flexibility. Um, and as Aaron said earlier, it focuses on person directedness and least restrictive alternatives as core values in APS practice. Um, on the line of collaboration, focusing on um, partnerships um, or multidisciplinary team approaches to um, 
Medicaid agencies, long-term care ombudsman, tribal APS, law enforcement. Um, the collaboration list is endless, so this, these are just some examples, um, but really wanting the coordination so that there is that standard um, when you are investigating that you are coordinating with other agencies that might be helpful in the investigative process. And then also requiring state entities uh, to create state plans at least every five years and submit annual performance pro, uh, program data um, annually. Next slide. So we are gonna get into um, the final rule worksheets. So we've got kind of the, I'm calling them a suite of, of worksheets or a toolkit of worksheets, but really they are um, aids for you to use. They are not required for you to use. This is just really to make the process a little more streamlined so that you have all the information that you need in a one-stop shop. So we're gonna be talking today about the state versus federal comparison worksheet. And for those of you that were involved in any of the operational planning meetings, um, Mike Bischoff and I, strongly encouraged you to use that worksheet so that you could really look at your state law, your state policies and procedures and compare them to the federal rule. Um, and that would give you kind of a better idea on the lift that you are going to have to undertake to come into compliance. Um, so that was a worksheet, again, very optional, but we strongly encouraged you to do something um, to do a, a state versus federal comparison. Uh, to see what kinds of things in the next four years you are going to have to do to come into compliance. So the next worksheet, and we will unveil this today, and again, this will be on our website, is the final Rule Next Steps worksheet. And that will be taking what you learned on the state versus federal comparison worksheet and putting it onto this Next step worksheet to kind of guide you in the process over the next four years. Um, we also um, will be giving you a tool and we are repurposing this tool um, from the operational planning days. It's called the strategic planning communicator, the strategic communicator. And this is like a one-stop shop that you would be able to convey to leadership the progress on your projects that you have identified that you need to do to come into compliance with the federal rules. So with that, I'm gonna have Mike Bischoff walk us through all of these worksheets that we are going to make available uh, for you. And he's going to give you kind of some background or some tips on strategic planning. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike and next slide. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> next, I'd like to uh, talk about a suite of three tools that APS TARC has available to help you manage the journey to final rule compliance. These tools are gonna to take you from a highly detailed definition of the final rule to a list of the projects you need to become compliant, apply to a one-page summary you can use as a tracking tool for your plan. So the, the first tool that many of you have already seen is that federal versus state comparison worksheet. Uh, it's available on the APS TARC uh, website. If you need help with it, your TARC liaison uh, can help you in, in understanding that. And really communication is key here to just uh, maintain regular communication with your, your TARC <coughs> liaison. Uh, if I can have the next slide then. So this, uh, most of you are familiar with this. Um, you probably looked at this uh, federal versus state communication worksheet when you're developing your operational plan. At that time, you needed to identify areas of need. You're trying to get a general sense of how close your program was to already being in compliance with the APS final rule for the purpose of allocating your Elder Justice Act grant funds. Um, this 50 plus page document is really broken down into eight areas of subpart D. The first being definitions. So it's 28 uh, kind of foundational terms where we wanna have enough similarity between states that we can uh, share and consolidate data. The second area is program administration, really defining who you serve and how you serve them. The third area has to do with the APS response, your uh, response policies and procedures. The fourth area is conflict of interest, both how to avoid uh, actual and perceived conflicts of interest. 
The fifth section has to do with your policies and procedures for accepting reports. The sixth then is about coordinating with other entities to ensure you uh, uh, coordinate with the appropriate uh, entities. The seventh area is your APS program performance about how you collect and maintain your system response data. And then the eighth area is around state plans. So you need to revisit this worksheet. At first you looked at it just to see where you uh, were compliant, where you needed additional work. Now you need to revisit it to develop more detailed uh, project plans for each of the needs that you've identified and to assign responsibility for each of those projects. I can have the uh, next slide, please. So after you complete that federal versus state worksheet, your second tool is this final, uh, final rule next step worksheet. Uh, it's a worksheet that's gonna be available to download after this presentation. It allows your program to gather their thoughts on approaching uh, approaches to coming into compliance with the final rule and get those all in one place. Uh, it's, it's for your use. It's not something you have to submit. If you have other tools you'd rather use, that's fine. But this is um, based around those same eight APS uh, final rule areas from subpart D. So it's going to tie directly to the uh, initial uh, federal versus state worksheet that you completed. What you're going to do here then is you're going to continue to use this worksheet to add projects, to track your progress, and work with your TARC liaison for support during this time. I can have the next slide, please. So I'm not going to work <clears throat> through all this, but this is uh, what it looks like. And basically, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's going to be divided into five sections, each organized along those eight subpart D uh, areas. It's going to help you define the projects you need to complete. Uh, it's going to identify the areas where you need changes. It's going to create some due dates and action items for each project that you initiate. And it's going to list the things you need to accomplish and other factors to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So you have a plan. You've completed your operational plans. And congratulations on that. You've established your vision for what you want 2828 to look like. You've redefined and recommitted to your mission and core values. You've taken a step back to uh, scan your environment. You've done that with help from others in your organization, as well as your external partners. You've clarified your organizational strengths and weaknesses. You have identified some opportunities and threats in the external environment. And hopefully you've identified some uh, blind spots and begun to take steps to address them. So as you put that together based on your vision, the SWOT, and the requirements of the new final rule, you've identified a handful of high-level goals that you want to achieve by 2028. And then you've provided more detail uh, on your immediate target improvement projects in that logic model table format. And the implementation of the final rule is the, the critical priority for those funds. You've got your plan now, but you can't keep it a secret. You really need to share it with everyone. That's the key to getting it implemented is to communicate it. So you want to, uh, for your plan to be effectively implemented, you want to share it every chance you get. Share the template with your team. Don't hide it away. Share it in group meetings and know it well enough that you can summarize it extemporaneously. You can explain it to someone outside your organization and you can accurately summarize it succinctly. Next slide, please. So kind of some, some basic project uh, thoughts for implementing your target improvement projects. Once you've completed your operational plan and you achieved buy-in, you need to develop the individual project plans and assign accountability to make sure that your goals are achieved. And for each of these plans, you need kind of what we call the four W's. So you need to state who is going to be responsible for achieving what result, when that result must be achieved by, and what resources are going to be available to the responsible party to complete their task. That might be time, money, other kinds of support. So the idea here uh, is to create this and then have regular follow-up to monitor them regularly. Just like you wouldn't create an annual budget, put it on the shelf and never look at it again uh, until you run out of money, you review your finances regularly, uh, probably monthly, so you can make adjustments as challenges arise. Maybe you need to cut costs or, or make other changes. Well, likewise, you can't define your projects that you need to become compliant with the final rule and then wait till 2028 to see if you've made it. But you need to review them regularly and make adjustments as needed. Uh, I find a quarterly review is usually a good cadence. The important thing is just that you have a regular 
calendarized review process so the responsibility responsible parties know that they're going to be asked about their progress every quarter and, and that they're going to need to report on it next slide please so this is the uh well i guess we don't have it in place here we have a new, a new tool i, I guess will we'll be available for downloading uh, after this uh and it basically it's um it, you'll, you'll recognize it as being a variation of the strategy communicator we used in 2022 when we did the ARPA operational plan. And now we're just modifying and repurposing it for APS final rule. It's a simple one page tool to show you the linkage from the APS TART sheet down to your actual projects. And so you can regularly update it in management meetings to track your progress. And don't be afraid to delegate. You don't have to do it all uh, individually. So the um, <clears throat> this spreadsheet, you, you'll just uh, update it and review it in uh, quarterly management uh, meetings. It's going to go from the individual projects, give a, a brief, a few word project summary, to list some of the key metrics, who's assigned to it, what the completion date is, and then probably the most important thing at the end of the uh, chart, there's just a green, yellow, or red. Think of it as a stoplight. So you may have several projects you're reviewing here. The ones that are green, the responsible party is saying, I've got this, it's on track, everything's okay. So you may not need to spend a lot of time in your quarterly management meeting reviewing those. One that is yellow is saying that you are facing some challenges. The one that's red is saying you're running behind. So in your management meeting, you don't necessarily have to review all of the projects, but those that uh, the responsible party characterizes as yellow or red, you wanna review and see what you can do to help them. Are there roadblocks you can remove, extra resources uh, that can be added? And so this is just a, a sample tool. Lots of other tools exist, but the, the key is using whatever tool you choose to regularly track your projects. Again, this will be available for download at the end of the session. Uh, next slide. So obviously we all have a lot of day-to-day -day responsibilities. But when you get strategic projects like this one time coming into compliance task, they get added on the top of our other responsibilities. So as leaders, we have to make sure that we make the time and resources available to those who are assigned responsibility for the task. Having regular calendarized discussion and reporting on a project helps keep it moving forward and keeps it front of mind. The uh, APS department director or leader doesn't need to be the one who leads each project, but they need to assure that the person who does lead them has the resources they need and help them remove roadblocks to complete the projects. And just a final thought here, with the new final rule, we're all participating in an unprecedented change in how APS services are delivered in the U.S. And that's ultimately going to make life better for vulnerable adults. It's the reason we all chose this profession. So implementing this final rule, while it's a, some extra work uh, on top of our day-to-day -day responsibilities, it's really going to be worth it in the long run. And then uh, next slide, please. So your path forward, these... Uh, Additional worksheets that we've, we've introduced are all available for download at the uh, APS TARC website. Uh, for each of the areas which are not aligned with the final rule, when you did your initial federal versus state uh, plan worksheet, you want to develop a project plan to come into compliance. And as you think about the Elder Justice Act grant funds you'll be receiving in coming years, you want to use those for your key projects, with final rule compliance being the first priority for the use of the EGA funds. Um, remember, you have the technical assistance for, for the uh, APS final rule is going to be available to your TARC liaison. And uh, another thought, just for items that require legislative changes, make sure you understand the legislative cycle. So there may be cycles where the legislators are not going to consider uh, any new legislation. You want to make sure that you have submitted things to them for change within a time cycle that's, that's going to work. So in these organizational change projects, I find it's usually helpful to get a few easy wins, do some of your easy projects first. Uh, sometimes we call that picking the low hanging fruit. It's a way to uh, get them done to build momentum and confidence. But don't wait too long to start your bigger, longer cycle time projects. Again, all these resources are available on the APS TARC website. And with that, I'll hand it back over uh, to ACL. Thank you. Next slide.
Thank you. Now let's talk about next steps. As we discussed earlier, over the next 12 months, ACL will be providing training and technical assistance, fact sheets, and FAQs about each section of the new regulation. We will be following the schedule we shared earlier in this webinar, where every month we will host a webinar, either covering a specific section of the regulation or a listening and networking session to discuss the previous, mo previous month's webinar. The rollout of resources related to special topics will coincide with that webinar. We are scheduling the upcoming topics based on feedback we've heard from states about which sections of the rule they have the most questions about. We anticipate this year will be a deep dive into learning about the new regulation. Once we've completed providing this series of training related to the final rule, ACL will begin offering a review of state self-assessments of compliance with the APS regulation in October of 2025. That will, review will also include reviewing state's plans to address the sections that you have determined are not in compliance with the APS regulation. The worksheet you learned about today will be the basis of that self-assessment, and ACL will establish a process where states can request for ACL to review this self-assessment. There will be more information to come about that process once we get closer to October 2025. ACL is also working this year on developing state APS plan guidance. We anticipate that the guidance will be posted for the first round of public comment between October and December of 2025. This is our target date. We anticipate the entire process of PRA review will take up to nine months and we are targeting to have the final guidance on state APS plans available by May 2026. This final guidance is dependent on how long the process takes, but the initial publication for public comment will give states an opportunity to see what we are planning to require in state plans. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to touch briefly on ACL program oversight and monitoring. The state plan is the mechanism through which states will demonstrate and ACL will evaluate compliance. The state plan sets out how the state entity intends to comply with the requirements of the regulation. APS systems must include assurances within their state plans that they will develop and adhere to policies and procedures that are set forth in the regulation. Performance data reported by states will be used to ass assess the extent to which state APS systems are meeting their state plan objectives. AP, I'm sorry, ACL will provide training and technical assistance as states develop their state plans to determine whether their policies and procedures and programs functions meet these minimum standards. Final state plans must be submitted to the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services by the May 8, 2028 compliance date. ACL will have a supportive corrective action process in place for state APS systems that are unable to meet the May 8, 2028 compliance date. This CAP process will be collaborative and states that experience challenges in complying with state require with specific requirements under the final rule may engage with ACL to establish a CAP and resolve those challenges under an extended time frame. Our goal is to make this process as supportive and collaborative as possible. And now we can move on to the next slide. Thanks, Erin. So now that you have all the information about the state versus compare, state versus federal comparison worksheet, the next steps worksheet, the strategy communicator, these are all tools that we have supported ACL in providing you um, the framework of how you are going to manage these projects that you see um, needed to come into compliance with the final rule. Some states might have one project, some states might have five projects. 
Um, we really just want to meet you where you are and in the support that you need. And like ACL, um, both Alice and Aaron have said, we're here to support you in this journey, right? So we've got the next four years to come into compliance. Um, Aaron outlined oversight and monitoring going forward. We would like to know today, if you have any questions, you can feel free to type them in the uh, questions box. Um, like Aaron said, we also are going to have that listening session next month. Um, registration will be going out in the next week or two. Um, so there will be an opportunity to have some feedback face-to-face uh, -face with your peers, with ACL on the line, to ask some questions about anything that happened in this webinar. But any questions today? And I'm going to hand it back to um, Leslie and Andy from the TARC to go through some of those questions. Okay, we do have a couple of questions that um, we'd like to have ACL answer. The first one is just so I'm clear, by May 2028, 20, we need to be in full compliance, correct? Not just have a final plan to be in compliance. And I'll repeat that question again. By May 2028, we need to be in full compliance, correct? And not just have a final plan to be in compliance. That's correct. May 8th, 2028 is the compliance date and states should be in compliance with the new regulation on that date. Okay, another question we have for you, Erin, is when will ACL announce the date, the data, I'm sorry, when will ACL announce the data that states will need to report on, which I understand will be different than namers? Again, when will ACL announce the data that states will need to report on, which I understand will be different than namers? We do not have a specific date for announcing that information we will need to engage in a public comment period for that as well and so that public comment period um we will do an initial um publication of what data we plan to connect, collect people will be able to comment on it and then based on that feedback we will issue the final um data that we will be collecting and so it will be um an iterative process so we don't have a final date at this time okay the next question that i have is i work for a program that is affected by aps where can i find the actual rules not just guidance document so can you post a link where can i find the actual rules just not guidance not just guidance doc documents um, if you go to the website, um, acl.gov backslash APS rule, you will see there a link um, to the published final rule, and that is in the Federal Register. Also on that page, we have a link um, on the sidebar to the full text of the final rule. We have a plain language overview of key provisions. We have a short fact sheet. And you can also read um, the announcement from ACL about the rule. So that website, which is, I'll say it again, acl.gov backslash APS rule is your page to go find all the information you need. And just to reiterate, Erin, that information is on slide four of the handouts, so they can refer to slide four of the handouts that has the website address. Okay, the next question. Can you speak more to the EJA grants that were mentioned? Are those only for state level programs or are they awarded to individual county level APS programs? This is a multi-part question. So can you speak more to the EJA grants that were mentioned? There's three, three sub questions. Are those only for state level programs or are they awarded to county individual APS programs? And how much funding is available through those grants? Um, yes, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, the Elder Justice Act grants that we discussed 
are formula funded grants that are administered, or I'm sorry, that are delivered through a formula that is found in the Elder Justice Act. They are delivered to states that um, based on a federal register notice and the formula for the amount that states receive is in the Elder Justice Act. We also, within the Federal Register Notice, announcing those grants, there's a table that says what each state is going to receive for that formula grant. And states then make a letter of assurance to us um, based on assurances that are outlined in the Federal Register Notice. And then states will receive the notice of award based on um, providing that letter of assurance. Those formula grants are only issued to states. They are not issued to counties. I think I answered all three parts, Leslie, but let me know if I missed one of them. <laughs> I think you did. Um, next question. Has there been discussion about how to integrate APS strategic directions, goals, assurances, into the state plan on aging as required by all state units on aging, rather than completing two state plans. And I can repeat that. Has there been discussion about how to integrate APS? Oh my head, my, my slide's moving, sorry. Guidance, strategic direction goals and assurances into the state plan on aging as required by all state units on aging rather than completing two state plans. These are separate plans because the Older Americans Act state plan is required in, under the Older Americans Act and based on receiving that funding. This is a separate state plan because it is from the Elder Justice Act and required under that and that is a separate um, funding stream as well. So that is why an, a, a state plan on aging is required under the Older Americans Act and then the APS state plan is required under the Elder Justice Act. And if I might add, Erin, um, there are APS programs that are housed under aging, but not all APS programs are housed under aging. So um, to require it under an aging state plan might not work for some states because of organization. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we asked, we do have one question that asked that you please restate the due date for the state plans. They want to. Uh, that could be confirmed. The state plan is due on the compliance date, which is May 8th, 2028. Um, so your state plan needs to be submitted to our office by that date. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, our target date for having the guidance out about the state plan. The final guidance, our target date is to have that out by May 2026, which would give states um, two years with that guidance available to develop their state plan. Um, but with our target schedule right now, we would have the, um, the state plan guidance available for co public comment starting somewhere between October 2025 and December of 2025. And when that goes out for public comment, you'll be able to see what we plan to request in the state plan. And that will allow states to understand at that point what we're gonna be looking for. So that'll kind of be a preview um, for you to have the first look and then the final guidance, our target is May, 2026, um, as I said. Okay, next question. At the director's meeting, we expressed concern about the regulation that a reporter can only be told of the screening decision with client consent. Has that received any further discussion at ACL? Again, has the issue of a, the regulation that a reporter can only be told of the screening decision with client consent received any further discussion with ACL? Yes, we are tracking every, um, all the issues that you are raising to us, all your questions and comments, and we are working through them. Um, and so this one has received um, additional consideration. We do plan to address that section in one of our upcoming webinars, but before that, we are actually going to be conducting a focus group of some 
APS state directors that we have reached out to directly. And in that focus group, we're going to try to understand a little bit better some of the things that you might be concerned about related to that section of the regulation, but also looking at what some solutions are going to be available and ways that um, states will be able to successfully implement that section. And we will be doing that prior to having the webinar on that section of the regulation so that once we have that webinar, um, we'll be best prepared to talk to you all about how to best implement it. Okay. Next question. If beyond legislative change to be in compliance, state needs to needs additional funding for to, to staff implementation of the final rule, what additional funding will be possible beyond the federal projections, funding projections that are, are offered? And again, I'm sorry. If beyond legislative change to be in compliance, the need for additional funding is identified to implement the final rule, what additional funding will be possible beyond the federal funding projections offered? Whoops, sorry, I was having a difficulty coming off mute that time. No worries. Um, we cannot speak to funding. Federal appropriations are determined by Congress, but um, if states do have um, questions about coming into compliance and the funding, we can um, speak directly to your project officer about that. Okay. Next question. Do you anticipate changes to the final rule as May 2028 gets closer? For example, my understanding is that client slash staff ratio requirements and caps was taken out of the final rule. Caseloads for APS worker is a huge issue in my state and has been for years. So I'm wondering if the final rule may be modified before 2028. Repeating the question, do you anticipate any modifications to the rule before 2028? So the final rule is the final rule. Um, we will not be making changes at this time to the final rule. Um, can I say a little bit more about the other part of that question, Leslie? And you might have to repeat it to me, but there was some concern about caseload. Um, I wanna put a plug in for a TARP product that we will be issuing here shortly. Um, Carl Urban from our office worked on a workload tool uh, that includes kind of caseload ratios in it. And once that is published, we did do a webinar on it as well as a session at the national conference. Um, but once that tool becomes available, we encourage states to go through the tool and share it with their leaders and legislatures to advocate for more positions. Thank you. And Leslie, I'll just say one more thing. I just want to, I, I do want to reiterate that the rule is a minimum floor. We are, states can set, um, they have a lot of flexibility to set their standards at different levels. So you, they can use that workload tool um, and these different resources to figure out what ratios might work for them. So even though a specific ratio is not required by the rule, that is something that states can have flexibility on their own. Okay. There's a clarifying question about something that was said earlier. Did they mention that also in October 2025, we needed to provide documentation about where our state is and is not in compliance prior to the comment period for the state plan. Did they mention that also? Uh, you, okay, go ahead. I, I, I got it, Leslie, thank you. Okay. Um, so it is not required. What we did say is that we will, in beginning in October, 2025, if a state would like to request ACL review, what they have determined they have either are in or are not in compliance with which sections, we will review that at that time. It is not required, it is just an option, and they can request the review. Um, and we will have, as we get closer to October 2025, more details about how that process will work, but it um, it is not a requirement. Okay, next question. Am I correct 
that all state developed policies and procedures need to be publicly posted online. Do all state developed policies and procedures need to be publicly posted online? Yes, that's correct. They all need to be publicly posted online. Okay. As they are related to the regulation. Okay. Another question, do we have any information regarding critical incident reporting for Medicare, Medicaid clients, I think. It says Medi Medi, but I'm wondering, Medicare, Medicaid clients. Do we have any information regarding critical incident reporting for Medi Medi clients? This is uh, this is a very broad question. Um, I'm not sure what really what you're asking here. Um, so perhaps more details could be provided about what type of information you're asking about. Um, because based on the question, I'm not sure what um, you're looking for. Okay, I'll let you know if I get a follow up to that. Will the funding always be April through March? Or will it change in 2028 to reflect other federal funding, namely October through September? Um, so future funding will be based on a congressional appropriation. At this time, we do not have any plans to change the current funding cycle, but um, it could change in the future based on the federal appropriations that are made. Okay, um, Jen, this was in response to, I believe, what you talked about. When is the workflow tool expected to be available? Um, we are just going through final revisions of the workload tool, so I would say within the next month. Okay, next question. Understanding the rule is a minimum floor. Whoa. If the rule has a definition that differs from state statute, is the expectation that the state change its law? So this is a complicated question to answer without knowing how the state def definition differs. Um, states are not required to adopt the definitions verbatim as they are presented in the regulation, but they do need to have um, they need to have the same principles in the definitions. And so if you have a question about a definition and how it might need to be changed, that's something that you could bring to your project officer to discuss with them. Um, it is also something you could look at in this self-assessment tool and that um, you will be working on. And the other thing is just a plug for our webinar in December, it will be about definitions. So we can we will be talking more about how you will adopt the definitions in that webinar. Okay, there are two follow up questions regarding the posting of policies. One, just confirming that the requirement is to post policies at the state level, or do county policies have to be posted as well? And two, if the procedure is not related to the rule, it does not have to be posted. And they want confirmation of that. Yes, so the policies and procedures just need to be posted at the state level um, and they just need to, and the requirement to post them is related to the APS regulation. If your own state has different rules about what others need to be posted, that would be addressed based on your state's um, requirements. So they gave the specific example of standard operating procedures not related directly to the regulations would not have to be posted, correct? Yes, I, whoop, I think I turned off my mic. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, um, I have to scroll back up. Things kept popping in and I think I lost a couple. Um, there was one that now I cannot see. Give me one second. There was a question if you, oh, 
there was a question that I actually can't find the exact verbiage of it now. Um, even though you do not have a specific date, that the specific data to be collected will be announced, is there an estimated time frame when we can expect that information? All right, I don't know if you were muted again. Whoop, I'm here. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> we are also likely looking at the um, PRA public comment process for that beginning in May 2026. Okay. Do we have reporting guidelines? The published rule had a comment that a guideline would be provided by Medicare in spring of 2024, but we have not seen anything come through. Um, this regulation is not related to Medicare, so I am wondering if this question is related to a different federal regulation. Um, I'm not sure how to answer. That's a really good point, Erin. I know that um, we've had a similar question to this uh, before. Maybe you can talk just briefly about how there are final rules coming out for other disciplines. And there is probably some crossover depending on organizationally where you fit. So can you just say maybe two words about um, how that might fit into how they're seeing these final rules? Um, yes, so the Older Americans Act uh, final regulation came out for that earlier this year as well. And the APS final regulation also came out. They have their own individual requirements. They have their own individual timelines. And so if this webinar is specifically related to the APS final regulation and um, Medicare does not fall under the APS final regulation. We have time for maybe two more questions, hopefully. Um, what recommendations do you have for advocacy organizations and other community members to get involved with the development of state plans? What are the requirements in the rule for public feedback? So we envision developing the state plan to be a collaborative process. The rule is broad here and states can decide how they want to seek feedback. So I think if you're a advocacy organization or any other stakeholder and you're interested in providing feedback, you could reach out to your APS state director and let them know that you wanna provide feedback, but states will be developing their individual processes for developing their state plans. But as part of our operational plans we did this past year, we did um, recommend that states do an environmental, um, an environmental scan where they work with stakeholders on that. And so we always encourage collaboration. Okay, uh, we have two state statutes which require giving case status to the reporting person without gaining consent from the client. The question, how is this to be reconciled when the federal law says one thing and the state law is in opposition? So we will be providing more guidance on this issue in the future. We do not have that sub-regulatory guidance prepared yet. But as I mentioned, we are going to be doing um, over the course of this year, the webinars based on different topics of the sections of the rules. And that is the type of information we are collecting and understand that that is an issue that some states are facing. And we will be addressing that um, later on during this course of um, webinars that where we're going section by section. Okay. Um... I think we do not have any more questions that you can answer in the time that we have remaining. Um, uh, Leslie, this is uh, Andy Kingport with the APS yes. Talk. I just chime in real quick. I wanted to let everybody know during the presentation, a couple of times we said that the handouts from today are available on our website. They're actually not available right now on our website, but they will be very soon. We'll send an email to everybody and let you know when those documents are available on our website and when the recording for this webinar is available both. So we will follow up and make sure everyone's informed when those go up on the web. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Andy. The, the 
slides and the handouts are similar to what you're seeing today. So if you want to have a sneak peek of what's going to be on the website, download the handouts from today. Um, they will give you kind of um, a head start on what is going to be posted on the website. And then also just make sure that if you do have additional questions that weren't answered today, or if you have a follow-up question, save those for the listening session. The APS um, exchange, um, that announcement should be going out in the next couple of weeks. Um, be sure to sign up for that if you want to um, be part of that roundtable discussion. Thank you everyone for your attendance today. We appreciate your time and attention and I wish you all a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody.